All right, welcome back everyone to Creative Survival. If you're new to the channel, <laughs> welcome. This is gonna be a fun one to start off on. Today's guest is Fabiano Altamura. He has been working for over 20 years at a very high level as writer, director, actor, producer. Uh, you know, <laughs> seriously ran the gamut in the creative circles in a professional space. So welcome Fabiano to Creative Survival. Thanks, man. It's good to have. It's good to be on your show, Craig. Thank you so much for inviting me. Sure. So just to jump off, just uh, I would love to just get a little bit of background from your point of view of just kind of what you've touched on creatively and kind of where you're at now. I mean, my journey's been one that's it's kind of been quite varied in the sense, you know, a lot of actors go in and focus on one kind of medium. I think I wanted to experience the whole gamut, as you mentioned before. So I started out. Um, in musical theater, then transitioned to kind of straight theater. Most of my experience has been predominantly in that theatrical space. Um, and then I moved to part in, in somewhat part to radio and then in business. And then I was an associate pastor and then went back into kind of film again. Um, and um, now I've been, the, the last two movies that I did, I was an actor and the other one I was as a producer and an actor on. So um, there's kind of been, a, it's been a very, very varied journey, which has been, I think I've, I've benefited from, you know, and I think having experienced multiple fac facets of the industry, not just one, um, has given me a somewhat a more of a diversified journey within it, specifically having come out of the industry for a few years and gone into the business realm and gone out and gone into the kind of church realm. But now I find myself in a teaching realm as well as the kind of producing and acting realm as well, which is something that I, I am very, very grateful for because you can actually put your your experience to teach other people, which leaves a legacy, right? So I'm curious, as someone who wears so many creative hats and has dived into so many things, along that journey from where you started, how did that play into kind of like your identity going through this creative process? Did you struggle uh, like thinking you had to pick one, were you open to embracing them all? What was that kind of experience like? I think what it was, um, Craig was, um, I didn't realize until I looked back on it that I, I went into acting because I loved it, but also had a bit of a, a business strategy to it. So why would I go into musical theater? The casts were bigger. So I'd have more of a chance of getting cast. Um, I think, the identity side of things is a completely other thing as well. I think when I first started, I was definitely defined by my last job or defined by a star that I'd worked with or whoever was, you know, blowing up in theater at the time. I think I was definitely defined by that and I compartmentalized my art and my faith. So that made my journey very, very, very up and down just because I was getting my value from my art rather than my art being ex an expression of worship in who I am in Christ. I like that your value pouring out of you rather than you trying to seek your value. Um, right. What was the tipping point for you to finally kind of realize that? Because sometimes it's really hard to even come to that realization. So how did that happen for you? It was a process, man. I, I think, you know, it took me a long time. I mean, I, I came to the United States to go to ministry school at a church called Bethel in Redding, California when I was 37. And I think that uh, my journey was probably very up and down until that point. You know, I, the Lord had spoken a lot about the industry to me, but for, for a real gap of like a wilderness gap of about 10 years, I wasn't really in that creative journey. I was in the creative journey, but my, my journey wasn't leading to that end goal of being full time in the entertainment industry. I was focused on becoming a businessman which really I know now help, help feed me into being a producer. Um, but that journey was one of, of many ups and downs, but coming to the point of settling where I think it was this, if I never get to act again, am I going to serve the Lord to the best of my ability and what's in front of me, right? Whether it be mundane, whether it be something that I've not necessarily said I want to fulfill, my, my commitment is to him on this journey to provide for my family and to to keep moving forward right not sitting back saying lord you open the door yes i get that but still moving forward going lord i know your voice is a green light if you want to stop me 
then I know your voice is big enough to stop me along this journey. So I just kept moving forward and forward and forward and getting closer and deeper with the Lord. Then we moved to um, Redding, California in August of um, 2012. And I think that first journey at Bethel School of Ministry really, I came not thinking I would ever be in the industry again, ever. And it was that year that I met one of my best friends, David Neroni, who I know you've interviewed. I know he's a good friend of yours. Um, and I think I started on that journey of not compartmentalizing my art and my faith and realizing that when God says, I am healer, I am comforter, right? I am all those things. It comes out of an overflow of his I am. So when I knew who I was, when I say I am actor, I am writer, it's an overflow. I'm not defined by it but I am definitely enhanced by it. So when I say I'm an actor now, man, it's something I can't help but do. You understand what I'm saying? Because it's an alignment of my faith and my art. Man, that's huge. That's, that is amazing. Uh, I'm curious, going into like compartmentalization, did you always grow up in faith? Is that something that came later in life? How did that play into... Um, just kind of your journey into acting and even to kind of where you're at now. Yeah. I mean, my dad is from one of 10 from a lot of from a real poor family in the South of Italy. And at four years old, he sat on a step and he um, looked up at the stars and just started to question about his existence. This is at four. And then he went to a monastery and had a horrendous experience. But that leads on to the fact that dad always spoke to me about faith. Now, I don't know, I would say he was probably saved. I don't know if we knew that language. It was in the Catholic Church. I love the Catholic Church. Um, but I don't know if I knew what that language was. When I was 10, looking back now, I had a very deep encounter with the Lord. Um, but still, I don't know what the language was. I actually gave my life to Jesus when I was 15 in 1991, 16. Um, but prior to that, I'd been involved in a cult. So I think there was always that hunger to search for him. I didn't know what it looked like, but there was always a hunger to search for him. Because I remember being in this cult and this guy claimed to be Jesus. I mean, it was, if you actually look at it now, it feels like an episode of The Office. Um, but it was, I actually felt because of my hunger for the Lord that I experienced him in that moment because the Lord meets us where our hunger and desire to find him is, right? So, um, it was after that this guy told me that this guy was really a bad false prophet and he really, really was a horrendous false prophet. It's comedic, to say the least. So anyway, I it was October 1990 and I got on the floor and I asked Jesus into my life. And then in 1991, February 14th, I got baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then from then on, really just been serving the Lord and you know, ups and downs like everybody goes through. They have times when they're really into their faith and times when they're not. Um, times of greater revelation than others. But I have always loved Jesus. Never once have I said, oh, I'm giving this up. You just don't allow, when you're in covenant, you just don't even allow that to happen, right? That's amazing. Because it's really hard, you know, for people, especially when, you know, when it rains, it pours and it's just bad thing after bad thing that could happen. Yeah. Um, yeah, the fact that you haven't been able to, you just say that's not an option is like that's inspiring well if you if you look at it if, if 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 the rain falls on the righteous and the unrighteous then i know that i want to live in the kingdom but god is there god is there my response to him is my response if i choose to walk away it doesn't alter the fact that he's still truth mm -hmm. does that make sense so yeah, yeah. I'm curious, um, just to quickly touch on it, what was appealing about the cult or like made you want to be a part of it? Um, being seen, I think um, it primarily came from a desire to want to know something greater than me. The origins of faith, I guess, you know, searching, a deep searching. I was looking for something else. Um, and I was young, I was 13, so I don't even know if I really knew how to fully articulate that. I just know being a spirit being, there was something in me that was the start of my journey into knowing who Jesus was. Wow. Um, and I think it was, I was just very intrigued by it. There was a real sense of belonging. So let me ask you this, going like, coming from like a strong kind of belief and then like this like 
really cool experience with Jesus and accepting, accepting him into your life and then moving into an industry where that's not necessarily the common thing or the cool thing to do. How did that play into your role into what you searched for, even to what you pursued, and then how compartmentalizing started to come into your life? I think I was very vocal about my faith, probably to a fault, because I didn't know who I was, and I realized that that didn't always work. I I was always, I, I don't think I was ever really influenced by the crowd, so that was one benefit, I think. I was always very strong in my opinions, um, sometimes again to a fault, but I think the Lord actually used that so that I wouldn't necessarily go too wayward. I think the compartmentalization thing for me was understanding, probably from a point of view of entitlement, why was I not getting this, this job? Why was that actor getting um, you know, um, promoted over me? Why, why, why were all these whys that were really self-inflicted? Um, rather than going, I'm just going to be the best at my art. And from that, the doors are going to open. But I think that negative self-internal viewing actually probably sabotaged a lot of success that I could have potentially had. Wow. And as well, if you think about it, you know, you might say, well, maybe you didn't get the jobs because you weren't the best actor in the world. Ah, that could be the case as well. Or the fact that God was actually preserving something for you because he's saving it so he can save you you know, from any, any fallout that you could have created with your lack of identity or, you know, your character, because everything's about stewardship, right? Are you stewarding everything well? If he can't trust you with it, then why would a loving father allow you to get to a certain level, which then blows up in your face, right? So for anyone watching this who might be like, well, hmm, maybe I'm not so untalented. What's that fine line of like, realizing okay this is and it could take years of like looking back but what's that fine line of like okay god is actually protecting me from myself versus okay i'm pursuing something that i'm not called to maybe i should kind of reevaluate wow bro that's a big question i mean if you're in community if you're in a good healthy community that gives you feedback that you can be open about. I think the moment as an artist, you start to treat yourself as an island and go, I don't need community. I don't need feedback. That's a very, very, very slippery slope. And it becomes all about you and not about him. If you're in community and you can tell you're pushing outside of his will, because you're open to feedback, you will start to sense that. If your heart is open to God, you will start to sense that you are pushing outside of his will. The grace will feel lifted off it. I know I went for an audition and a friend of mine was producing it. Um, this this, this well-known actress was, was the lead. Um, they were looking to um, not cast me as the lead, but they wanted to see me. Um, the, the film was very risque, to say the least. There were a, a few love scenes in it. And I tried to think, oh, it's my friend who's producing it. I'm going to go for the lead. It's great. Okay, there are a few love scenes in it. It's not really what I want to subscribe to. But at the end, there was a line that talked about God. So I used that as a way to twist the story for me to go down and at least audition for it. Everybody's like, fab, you don't want to do that. Your wife doesn't want you to do that. Why are you going down? So I knew that I was pushing outside the boundaries I'd given myself just for intrigue. So I went down anyway and sabotaged the entire process because I knew it wasn't right. You know, but I knew that was an indication to me that nah, I should not have pushed that. I should not have gone down for that audition. It's all in community and how tender your heart is for the Lord. The moment you start to think, I am doing it all on my own, it's very dangerous. You get those people that say, oh, I'm, I'm a prophet. I don't need community. And then who's going to test the word? Who's going to test the word? It's just your word. Then they don't become safe as prophets. And anyone watching too, like if for whatever reason, like, because there's a lot of people who haven't either been raised in church or experienced church, but even if you don't know where to find a healthy, like faith-based community of artists, like have a healthy community. Right. Right. So people who, yeah, like I mean, said, whatever will, that looks like. Yeah. I mean, yeah. a healthy community is one where people aren't just the same as you, you know, people that are wiser than you, people that are 
maybe from a different background. Um, now, obviously, if you're asking them about a role, I mean, I think there can be real harm asking a pastor about a role that you should and shouldn't take because they don't understand the industry and they don't understand what it's like to be an actor, producer, director, whatever. So I think there can be some helpful insight. I wouldn't necessarily make my sole decision based on that. But yeah, I mean, if you're not in a faith-based community, because let's be honest, just because you're in a faith-based community does not make it a healthy community. Does it at all, as you know, you know? So I think you just want to be around people that really love you and want your success and want your um, uh, want your your best. 100%. I, I don't know if I can speak into that other than if it's a faith-based community, that's definitely the best way um, because somebody might say, oh, go for it. It's only a love scene. What does it matter? But you know in your heart, there's just there's just something that's not right about it. And we're talking about love scenes now. It might not just be love scene and it's not only isolated to that. But yeah, I don't, yeah. I hope that answers your question, man. No, it really does. I'm curious for you too. How did you go about setting your your boundaries for yourself? Because a lot of times in in creative fields, it's, you know, it's art and art is art and it's not, you know, you're you like separate yourself from that, right? Like, oh, I'll go and do X, Y, Z for the name of sake of art or money or, you know, this will advance me. And, but how did you go about setting your boundaries and what did that look like for your journey? I mean, I guess a lot of it, because I got married quite young, a lot of it is what my wife would be comfortable with. Um, I also think setting a boundary for myself, knowing do I want to be known for that? Not that I, let's be honest, I've not had a ton of opportunity to do all those kind of things, which is great. Um, but I think I would I'd stop at nudity, stop at any graphic love scenes, um, just because I don't think they've pushed the story forward. It's like, what is a compelling story? Is it needed? Is it something that I necessarily want my kids to see, want people in church to see? Do you know what I mean? So. I'm not just limiting my audience to that guy. Would I not do that? But the point is now, if I look at it now, I, I'm in a position where I have students. I'm in a position where I'm, you know, um, a leader in an environment in, in one of the most influential churches in Christendom. You know, stuff that I would have taken a while ago would be very different to what I can take now because I'm not just thinking about my career. That's not what I'm thinking about. It's like, and also a thing as well, what's glorifying to the Lord, you know? Um, I bring it up to nudity because that's probably one of the areas where I wouldn't necessarily go with like love scenes and all that kind of stuff. You know, cussing and, and that kind of stuff doesn't bother me as much if the story's good and it's and it, and it and it pushes the story forward. But anything that's just gratuitous for gratuitous sake, I, I for me it doesn't it doesn't make any sense. It feels like we're trying to we're trying to shock the audience, which just cheapens cheapens it in my opinion. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree, especially when it comes to something like violence. Like, I don't mind violence if it fits a story and it's not, like, glorified on screen just for violence's sake. Like, you have right. something like Saving Private Ryan or Gladiator or, you know, right. any anything like that. Even, even uh, like, Lost Boys or anything. Like, it's, it's, it's just, it's not gratuitous just because. Right, right. And so for me, I and don't I'll have be a problem. I mean, I might be pretty controversial in this, but like, or unless it's theatrical. So like you look at Tarantino, his movies are so overtly theatrical. Um, for me, that violence, yes, it, it's a lot, but I just think like with Kill Bill, yeah. like I'm not advocating that or not, but it's just a very theatrical piece, right? It's, it's, a, it's a style as opposed to... Um, you know, just absolute brutality. It's the brutality of things that I think is disgusting. You know, what you would get in certain horror movies, like say, Hostel or yeah. things like that. You know what I mean? That's just brutality, which I think is shock factor, which I don't like. So then looking at kind of where you're at now, if, not to say you can go back and redo it, but if you could go back and like, like visit yourself at any point in time during this, when would you want to visit yourself and what advice would you want to give yourself to kind of just help with where you're at to get to where you're at now? That's a really great question. <sighs> <laughs> wow. Um, I, 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 I don't know. I think probably 
when I got my first Hollywood movie, um, I think what I would have done, because I was on it for the first three weeks, had a couple of months off, then went back for another nine weeks. In that, when I first got that, I was I was in a really great space with the Lord, and I got really entitled in between. Um, and it wasn't a massive role, but it was a nice role for my first movie. I think I would have just told myself, "Don't let don't let this affect you. Don't be arrogant to think that this is going to happen again. Just concentrate on who you are in Him. Concentrate on the craft, and just." Just be secure in who you are, right? You know, if you don't get another movie after this, just enjoy every single moment and cherish it, you know, and um, also get a better agent. That would have been mine as well. <laughs> get a better agent. It always comes down to that good agent, right? <laughs> um, it does come down to good agents. And, um, you know, at the time I, I was doing a movie with Gerard Butler and he introduced me to his agent and um, I had a meeting with him. I didn't get signed with him, unfortunately. I, I saw the value that when you have a very good agent, because mine was boutique, mid-tier, um, just did not have the business acumen that you needed for that point to actually start to break. Because I actually thought at that point with the right representation, um, things would have pushed forward much better. But she was she was just not very good. So going back to instead of – because we're always told, like, you're only as good as your last job, and that's usually what people look at, right? And we're just told that so often, especially in the creative, you know, community. Um, what for you – what was the journey, and what did it look like for you to finally switch into, well, okay, my – the stuff that I do will come out of my value rather than the stuff that I do give me value? Yeah. Yeah. I think um, coming to to Reading, California, being part of Bethel, really, really helped that journey and just a really healthy community and me realizing that I get to act. It's not a right, right? I get to do what I do and every moment that I do it, I realize it's a blessing. And being in the United States is a blessing and having my family is a blessing. So everything is, it, it's not, I'm not entitled to it. I'm blessed that I get to do it. And I think it was like, it's very similar to auditioning, right? When you go to audition, you want the job, you invariably never get the job. I had to flip that and go, oh, I actually get to audition. Whether I get it or not, I get to perform in somebody, in front of somebody. And I, I booked a lot more doing that. And I think that now my whole life is consumed with the entertainment industry. And it's an absolute, it's a beauty to be part of it. It looks very different to what I originally thought it would be, but I'm more fulfilled now than if I was constantly acting from one gig to the next, um, because I'm starting to be able to see it from a healthier point of view. And I get to impart my journey in a great community and teach other actors the same things. So hopefully they won't make the same mistakes that I have made and they get to go out into the community and be a really, a really good representation of the face of God, you know, Exodus thirty three eleven and Moses spoke to God face to face as a man speaks to a friend. That face in Hebrew is ponim, which means the presence. So if I can teach actors to go out and just display his face with not an alternative motive to con to convert, but just to show the glory of his face, then what else is there? You know, because it all comes from authenticity, right? Everything oh, right. It's all about all one hundred percent authenticity. Yeah which I think is lost a lot too in this kind of field where it's always like, Oh, who can I know to boost me up? And you know, Oh, who can I meet? What party can I go to? And whose hands can I shake to, to get me to that next level yeah. rather than approaching people with an authenticity and knowing that you do have value you could bring. They're not the ones that are controlling your value. Right. Exactly. And that's the thing. So going back to your line, you're only as good as your last job. I actually, I actually don't believe that comment. I don't believe it anymore. I think, no, my value comes from him, not my last job. And if my last job was great and was a big movie, or it was, you know, the last two jobs I did were totally, totally polarized. So one was a tween musical called The Bright Ones. And I played a, a teacher, basically playing myself. Then the next one was a movie called Unplanned that I helped co-produce. Right. So one was about abortion. One was a tween musical. 
one did really well at the box office, the other didn't. But I'm not defined by either of them. I celebrate them both because I got the opportunity to be in them both. Does that make sense? One was a cameo, one was a lead. But, you know, actors are judged by their stats and their social media presence. You know what? I get that. It's a business. Let's be honest. We're products. You know, everything is generated by and pushed forward by the dollar amount. But even though I get that as a businessman, I'm not going to get my value from that, of whether I'm a good actor just because my last two movies, you know, one was, you know, one was a success and one was still a success, even though the box office uh, data didn't necessarily say it was. I'm curious, as, as someone who has a lot of business experience, especially going like in this field, what would you say to other aspiring actors who are like moving forward and like they know that like they, they've kind of hit that wall, right? Where they're like, well, okay, if I keep putting all my value literally into everything that I do rather than what I'm producing, like what would you say to them? Because money is... Like, we can't say, like, money's not important, right? Because we all have to pay bills and we have to eat of and course, a lot of yeah. us have families. Yeah. So from a business point of view, what does that look like and how can they strengthen that while moving forward trying to pay bills? Does that make sense? Right. Of course, I get it. And sometimes the business might be outside of your art. If it's with your art, great. Mine was real estate. So the first Hollywood movie that I got gave me enough money to start investing in real estate, right? So I would... Um, my dad had a, was a very high-end barber, and I would see his clientele were all in real estate. So I would just spend time just communing, converse, com, conversing with them and just finding out more and more, always with people that were much more successful than myself. So I actually was one of the benefits. I had an opportunity to do that because of my dad's clientele. So that was definitely, definitely a benefit a benefit, but it was something that my dad did as well. He kind of taught me bits and bobs. I just took it to a different level, but I just, I was very, very interested in something else other than acting as well, um, which took me out of the industry ish for about 10 years because I focused on um, developing, you know, as an actor, you don't have a pension scheme. So I focused on building a pension scheme and that's what it was, you know, was real estate, which then when I moved to the US cause I couldn't work and I was studying for four years, enabled to keep me here you know so yes I, I liquidated a lot of the portfolio to be here but if i didn't have that then how would i have done it so it created an element of freedom right financial freedom to some extent um but i would say if you can make money from your art and you can generate your own content because we are in a season right now with streaming that content is king yes jesus is king but content is king so if you can value the fact that, you know, you're not just an actor, you're diversified, you might be a, you know, you might have a great networking side. So you can find projects. And then as a networker, you can bring money to the table to get the project greenlit. That's a business. That's a business acumen. Or you write your own screenplay or you develop your own theater company. All that feeds into what? The company that I work for is called Bethel Conservatory of the Arts. It's creative missionaries, creative and entrepreneurs, um, and creative. Um, um, sorry, I'm saying the third one. I'm forgetting it because I'm right in the moment. But one of them is creative entrepreneurs, you know, and that's to actually sustain um, a living from from your art. That's great, and it also might sound. I'm sure to some people it might sound scary, right? Because it's you have that FOMO of like, oh, if I like try to kind of seek this, even if it's within the realm of their their art and the way they express themselves, like it, it can feel that like little pull of like, well, but if I'm not 100% into this, then I'm going to miss out on all these opportunities. Yeah. But in actuality, I would say that was a falsity. And if you have security, you have more chances to do bigger risks. Right. I, I guess so, man. I mean, there is definitely something about being laser focused and not shotgun. Mm -hmm. Laser focused is thinking of the one, the shotgun is a slight dispersal of your talents. But the thing is, people say there's a lot of opportunity, but if there's no opportunity there, what are you going to do? Are you going to just sit back and wait for the for your agent to call or are you going to hustle? Right. If there's a lot of opportunity that's coming, well, what are you doing in the waiting? You know, if I'm not acting, then 
Am I going to write? Am I going to teach? Am I going to find opportunities? And then if other opportunities come when acting comes, I'll deal with that at time. But what I'm going to say is, oh, I'm not going to do that just in case. Because usually I spend more of that time in the just in case. And it, the phone's not ringing 150 times a day. Do you know, you know what I'm saying? So I'm still going to hustle forward to make things happen rather than let life happen to me. You can't be in this industry unless you hustle, man. You, you've got to hustle. I'm, I know we were talking about networking. You can still do that from a place of authenticity rather than of desperation. The moment you do it out of desperation, they can sniff it a mile away. So the idea of networking is still out of relationship. But you've got to realize your value in that. If I connect with you, it's because I have some value to bring to the table. So it could be mutually beneficial rather than like, oh, I just need you. I just need you. I just need you. If you don't have that value in yourself, then you're going to be very desperate when you network. Yeah. Yeah, because that's a good point. Because you can say, look, I, you can tell like in a way, be like, hey, I need you. But at the same time, you're going to need me. And here's why. And not in a cocky way, but you just know what you bring to the table and you know that they need that. Right. Your skill set and their skill set. It's all about relationship. People can say, oh, we invest in education or we invest in money. No, you always invest in people. At the end of the day, you're really investing in people. So when you find your skill set and their skill it, it's literally about the relationship. Some people will say it's about the money. That's very, very unfortunate because it should really be about investing in people. Like Joseph networked. When, when he said to the, the cup bearer, he says, remember me. When you go to your king, remember me. So he was like saying, listen, I want to get out of this hole. <laughs> you know, I'm in prison for something that I didn't commit. I'm not a rapist. I'm, I'm in prison. So please remember me. And then the cup bearer didn't, didn't remember him for two years. But then after that, that relationship and seed that he created was remembered. Right. So even even Joseph did it. And I think that's a good point, too, because like you said, it was two years. So even if you connect with someone, it doesn't mean it's going to launch you off right into not this at all. next big thing. And it might not even lead anywhere or who knows, years down the road, they might all of a sudden you might come to mind and then they reach out. Correct. I don't think any any encounter with another human being should ever be taken for granted. And should be one where you're like, I, I don't even know what happens. But if I've honored them, I've shown them that I'm into them, you know, like they're the only person at that time. I'm not kind of cocky and looking around everywhere and treating them as some subclass citizen. That, who knows what the Lord could do at any given point, you know? Yep. I mean, even for yourself, imagine if someone came up to you. You have 10 people in a room, nine of them are desperate going after you because of the people you know and the knowledge you know. And then the one person sits down with you and actually gets to know you and like has a connection. And at the end, right. even mentions, man, if there's any chance, I would love to work with you now or in the future <laughs> and just leaves the door open. Which one are you going to think of? Well, you're going to think of then, and you're always going to think of the one that will come and serve. Mm -hmm. So for example, I'm employing somebody at the moment who is, um, He's a film composer. First thing he did was when we were at a son hero camp, which was a father son camp with our church, just came up to me and started chatting to me. No, he didn't need anything. And then he did two of my shows. He volunteered. Whilst in school, I wasn't taking advantage of him in any way. But I'm like, if I say no to you and you want to do it, I might be stopping you from getting the blessing that you need. So I was like, bro, well, this is a thing. If you want to do it, that's great. But I'm just letting you know it's a relatively big project. No problem. But from that, he's come to be a close friend now, and I'm employing him. Do you understand what I mean? It's like people, because my dad taught me a trade, he taught me to be a hairdresser, and I was like, well, what value can I bring to somebody? I know you need a haircut. I know Reading does not have any decent hairdressers. So I would go to some of the leaders that I wanted to hang out with and said, listen, I know you're probably not going to meet with me because you have 150 people pulling on you, but I'd love to bless you with cutting your hair. Then I become friends with them because it's that intimate setting. And now I've given them something that I know they need. And I have something that I want from them. And now we become friends. Do you, do you understand what I mean? So it's yeah. all about, it's not wrong to have an agenda. But as long as that agenda is relationship, it's different. If I know your agenda is to promote or use my network to get hired, I'm going to sniff that a mile off. Or 
if I see you doing it, there's going to be a hard conversation we're going to be having in that moment, you know? Yeah. That brave communication, because at the end of the day, if somebody's trying to benefit from you, it shows that they've got an issue in their heart. And then it's it also, it comes community. back to the community thing, because if you yeah. only try to use people, even like if your agenda is this person does have something that I can use and I know I have something I can bring to the table, but you get to know them rather than I'm going to use them as soon as I get what I want, they're gone. And that just, it essentially just like you said, creates an island. It does. And that's a heart posture, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Because it's me, 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 me. So what that's saying is I don't have a value for you and I don't have a value for community. I only have a value for my own voice. Um, something too, I want to touch on because we talk about community and you talk about boundaries that you were able to get from your wife being married early. How does, cause one question I get a lot too, especially in, in film industry is how do I have a family? Cause I have two kids and a wife. And for you, what was that like balancing a family in an industry where sometimes it could feel like you're not supposed to acknowledge your family? It's weird. Right. I think you have to, you have to include them at every, at every single point. You know, you have to include them in decision. You realize that my career is not separate from my family. My first calling is to my family, not to my career. My career is helpful because it provides food for my family. But we never have to mistake the priority. The priority is always the stewardship of who I'm married to in covenant relationship and my children. So I will always count this cost and see if what the burden that will put on. So when I was here and I was filming Unplanned in Oklahoma, you know, I would be away 10, 10 days, 10 days, two weeks at a time. But I'd factor in into my contract that I have also have a day job and my employer is being very graceful that I'm coming back. So uh, allow me to film and have my job at the same time. So I, I have to factor in all those things. Like if it's something that's going to take me away from my family for three or four months, I'm going to be having that conversation with my family to see if they can fly out, if I can put it in my contract, that they can be here once a month or whatever, because I can't let the burden of a job ruin my family, man. I mean, it's just not worth it. I mean, what kind of a father would I be? So I actually think it's very possible to have a healthy work life and a healthy family life. I don't, I don't think they are mutually exclusive. I think if you're a hustler, there are times when you will swing out of balance but I don't think life is really about balance. I should try to be, if that can even be attained. It's knowing your seasons. So a friend of mine, a very prolific worship leader, travels hundreds of days a year. Well, I mean, probably the 200, but he'll always bring his family. Every time he's on stage, he'll bring them on stage. He'll always make it about them. Um, and for me, it's like I don't travel as much, but if I do, I'll always look at the impulse the impact of that on the family has to because listen i don't have to travel to be a burden on my family i can work 15 hours a day and i'm still being a burden on my family in the same city so it's a case of priority right because oh, i can i can you can be absent in your own house yep yeah are you emotionally distant do you not communicate do you just work all the time come home I remember I had a had a job. I had to be on set for quite a while. But like I got my wife. We just had our first. But like I left before our baby was awake, and I got home when she was asleep. And it was like, and my wife's exhausted. I'm exhausted. And like, if you don't have foundation and you don't have community within your own family and and communication, like that could have been very ugly. And then right. prioritizing and then finally going like, hey, this schedule is not working. Like, yeah. I need something to change because that is not worth sacrificing relationship. Right. right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Craig, can I ask you a question? Sure. We met, in, we met through Noah Elias, didn't we? We did. Yeah. Uh, you reimagine. Remember that? You remember that? Reimagine. I was going to say, I was thinking, of, we, we did <laughs> reimagine. I was like, of course I did. Do you remember that? Yeah. I do. Yeah, of course, man. Man, which I is... I remember that now. I was, like, I was coming back again. I was like, of course, <laughs> man. It was reimagine again. That's exactly where it was. Yes. I was like, I wonder if he'll remember that. Yeah. Man, that's funny. Actually, that's something I wanted to talk to you about, too, before we wrap yeah. up is... So, we first met at the Reimagine Conference. Yeah. 
for Noah. And then that was the first time I witnessed your dream circle. Yes. Which was so powerful. Wow, man. How, how did that come about? And for the audience, like, like, how did you even come up with that exercise? And what is the purpose of that? Yeah, I didn't come up with it. I can't, it was the Lord 100%. The question was, we'd set up a small Christian school and I was like, Lord, how can I teach the kids that acting is an art? It's fun, but it's also a discipline. And he said, put some masking tape on the circle in the middle of the floor and say, when you enter the circle, you can do whatever you want. But the moment you step out, class resumes to normal. So I was like, wow, that sounds really simple. So I did it and it worked to charm. Because if you do something and you have no definitive boundary, then the energy or the angst is going to be in the four corners of the room. And the only way to leave or get rid of that is to leave the classroom. And you can't do that during a class. So then I started to do it with actors because you could do a highly charged scene, aggression, love, whatever. But if you don't have a definitive space to step out of and give your permission to leave that space, again, the atmosphere will go into the four corners of the room. And the only way to escape it is by leaving. So I started doing it with pastors, dreams, like as you saw at the Reimagine conference, not everybody was an actor. What happened is the moment I allow myself or if I create a safe space for somebody to enter in and they do their three freeze frames of their dreams, whatever that be, or share their heart, they're doing it from a place of safety because they know that everything is contained to that circle. So the moment they stand out, there's no judgment and they can see objectively what they just did. So creating that safe space where you create that atmosphere that's contained to the circle, that dude just went on a whole different level. And now that's become my acting technique. Man. Because all people want is a safe space with no judgment. But if they can't visually see that safe space, they'll always shut down. That's amazing. Is there a way that someone, or would you mind if someone even practiced that in their community since... They obviously can't come up to the conservatory. Right. And, and, uh, I wouldn't because I've seen people do it without the experience and the context. And because my book isn't out yet, oh, it okay. doesn't give the parameters of how to do it. So it could be dangerous if you haven't, if you don't know what to do yourself. Right. It's not that it's dangerous per se. It just depends. It depends if you know how to do it. You need to set things up. It's like a story. I've got to set it up right. And then I've got to pay it off. I've got to conclude it, right? So there's yep. just got to be a way to do that. And I think I'm in the process. I get a text from a, a friend of mine, very, 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 very well-known actress. And she says, have you written the book yet? Yesterday. And I went, I haven't. But that's a good kick up the backside to know that I've really got to get on it because the Lord is breathing on it right now. <laughs> so I'm just trying to figure out. I've, I've got a lot of um, content around it. It's just how do I how do I start putting pen to paper right now to sure. start finishing that in the next couple of months? Yeah. That's awesome. When it comes out, I'll put the description down in the, thanks, but I appreciate it. Thanks, man. That was, that was really powerful. Thank and actually, you. that's a good thing to almost end on. So, cause you do, you have your full-time work. You've had a, a theatrical release this year. Like you've had all this stuff on your plate and now you have like this kick in the butt to start writing a book that could, yeah have major impact on, on people and like the way they experience, how does that, and you have a family. <laughs> yeah. So looking forward to like the book, what was kind of making you put it off? And then like, what's your view on it right now? Of, I think putting it off is like, you know, used to pr pr sometimes probably a self belief. Am I really a writer? You know, so what I mean, I'm going to written play and kind of stuff like that. But sometimes it's just a thing like I procrastinate with it rather than saying, I'm going to do it. But in procrastination, I become disobedient. Um, so now it's kind of the case of, no, I'm, I'm 44 years old. I God has given me four books that I know of, of what I'm going to write on. Um, and I better start putting pen to paper. Otherwise, you know, I'm, I'm going to find it's going to be another three years and I've not done it. And then I've gone the realm, past the realms of disobedient. And the Lord's like, I'm, that's not cool. You need to do it. Or somebody else is going to write it. Oh, 100%. And when you step into that, like the place that you're supposed to be, there is that acceleration, right? Yeah. Even when you, yeah, of course. Yeah. You know, totally. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Ah, oh, that's awesome. So then just for the audience, like anyone who's been touched by this and 
kind of wants to just kind of follow what you're doing and know more about you or even kind of maybe reach out on socials, where can they find you? Yeah, I'm on Instagram, Fabiano Altamora. I'm on, um, I'm on Facebook, Fabiano Martel Altamora. And then we are on um, Instagram for BethelConservatory.com. Okay. Uh, Bethel Conservatory of the Arts. That's who, um, what David Neroni and I, we founded that with Bethel Church. Um, so you can follow us on all of those platforms. Awesome. And I'll put the... Or at BethelConservatory.com okay. as well. Yeah. Yeah. I'll put the links in the description. Well, Fabiano, I just want to thank you so much for your time. This has been this has been so much fun. I, I hope I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I oh, have. Really enjoyed it, and it's great to see you again, man. <laughs> right? God's been connecting yeah. me with people in crazy ways. It's been it's been amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's great, great to see you again. So it's like, Craig, that's it, that's it, that's where we met. That was like three years ago, wasn't it? Yeah, three or four, something like that. Yeah, that was a while ago. All right, everyone, thanks for watching Creative Survival. If you enjoyed the video, if you got something out of it, just comment below, give us a like. Like, I want to continue the conversation because the whole point is to just grow together. We're all in different places and different journeys going through different stuff. So I just want to hear from you and we can all just kind of continue this and just grow together. Oh.